Hello and welcome to Fireman's Hall Museum's membership meeting night. We're just giving a few minutes for the people to load in from the lobby and then we'll start our presentation. Thank you for your patience. Your internet connection is unstable. Yeah, well, it's been that way all day. Mm -hmm. He's not talking right now, man. No, he's waiting for me to talk, I think. Brian, can you hear us? Yes, I'm just waiting for the individuals to load in from the lobby. Sorry, we, we lost our connection for a sec. You're good. I'm just waiting for everybody to load in. Very good. Those joining, we're just waiting for the people to load from the lobby into the presentation for the right. webinar. We'll be starting momentarily. We will be just starting in just a few minutes, just waiting for the last minute individuals to join. All right. Hello and good evening. Welcome to Fireman's Hall Museum's membership meeting night. Tonight we have a wonderful presentation given by the nation's largest fire museum, the Hall of Flame in Phoenix, Arizona. Joined with us tonight is the director, Chuck Montgomery. Chuck is an executive, executive director since January 1st of 2020, has 30 years with the Glen, Glendale Fire Department as a deputy chief, director of Glendale's Regional Public Safety and Training Center, and a board member of Arizona State Fire Training Committee. As a Bachelor of Science in Fire Science, Columbia Southern U. Giving the presentation tonight will be the curator, Mark Moorhead, curator of education for 15 years, a bachelor's in communications from Gannon University, area PA, a stage actor for years and a journalist for the Phoenix News Time and Phoenix Magazine. Thank you both for joining us. And Mark, you can start your presentation. Thank you very much, Brian. And thanks for, uh, to everybody for uh, having us. We are so honored to be able to participate in this. We really appreciate it. We never get tired of talking about the Hall of Flame. Uh, we also wanted to make a point of expressing our condolences just on behalf of everybody here at the museum for the recent tragedy. Uh, with the row home there in Philadelphia. It's been a rough season back east between the Bronx and uh, Philly and, uh, and uh, Baltimore. And, and we're just very saddened to hear about all of it. But uh, we, particularly our thoughts are of course with the, with the fire departments in those cities. And on a personal note, wonderful for me to be talking uh, with folks from my beloved home state of Pennsylvania. Uh, I miss it, just not this time of year. Um, but what we wanted to talk about tonight uh, was just for folks who maybe don't know or maybe have visited us, but not in many, many years, just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the Hall of Flame Museum of Firefighting, which is here in Phoenix, Arizona, and which is, you said, Brian, the, the nation's largest. Well, you're right, but I 
have to brag a little bit. It's actually the world's largest, at least as far as we know, we are the world's largest historical firefighting museum. There are a lot of great firefighting museums uh, in the United States. There's at least 200 of them in the United States. And there's many in other countries as well. But we believe we are the largest uh, and actually the largest by a pretty good measure. And unlike most fire museums around the country and around the world, we are not parochial. We're an international collection. We have uh, pieces, most of the larger pieces are from the United States, but we have stuff from all over the world. And actually, if you count our patch collection, we have stuff from every continent, even Antarctica. Uh, so you really kind of, you, you kind of get in a way, I mean, we still have a few gaps in our collection, but I'd say in a way, you kind of get the whole picture when you come and uh, visit the Hall of Flame Museum. And uh, we are a museum, not only are we a great museum to visit, we're a great museum to visit multiple times. So even if you've been there, you should come back. You should come back more than once. Now you see our, our logo here uh, on your screen. If you, uh, if this guy over my shoulder here is this guy, Chuck Montgomery, seen here. He's the one on the he's the one on the right, by the way. Uh, the on, on the left is his uh, grandson Arlo, and uh, Chuck's uh, a fairly recent addition, fairly recent addition to the staff. Here, uh, he's been with us for a little over two years now and uh, made a great many much needed improvements to the museum. And, uh, but he comes to us after a really illustrious career in Arizona firefighting. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he was a, a deputy chief with the city of Glendale for many years. He was also the chief of uh, one of the big training academies here in the Southwest, the Grip Stick. And uh, say hello, Chuck. Hi, Philadelphia, glad to see you this evening. That's about Mark. as much as I plan to let him talk. <laughs> Mark, um, can can you can you hit your uh, PowerPoint slides start slide at the bottom? That way you can just. Oh, see I sure can. Screen. I'm sorry. I uh, can try. Hang on. Where where are we looking? Start right. slideshow. Yep. We got it. Okay. Very good. Okay. So that's that is the guy we was just talking about, Chuck, and that's Arlo uh, uh, to his left. And uh, as you can see, he's a very uh, very accomplished. A uh, firefighter and uh, and also a very accomplished administrator, and we're very lucky to have him. Uh, as I said, he's kind of, you know, many of the changes he's made here have really kind of helped us to come into the 21st century as a museum. You know, firefighting, as I'm sure you know, Brian, it kind of moves slowly, and change is very slow coming sometimes, and that's true here at the museum as well. But Chuck has made a lot of really major changes in a very short time, and, and we're uh, we're very grateful for them. Now, that's me. You went over this stuff, but I, I actually don't have a firefighting background. I was uh, in the theater for years, and I was in uh, I was also in journalism. I was a newspaper writer for many many years, and uh, I did a lot of other little things. I was in publicity, marketing, uh, corporate security, various other things. But I've been here for uh, now actually 16 years, slightly over 16 years. And uh, I've really come to it late in life, but I, I really have found a, a great passion for the history of, uh, of the fire service. And this is an outdated picture of the Hall of Flame. You'll find the signage to be a little bit different now. Uh, and also our hours are different. We used to be open every day, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sunday from noon to 4 p.m. We're now closed on Sundays and Mondays, but we are open Tuesdays through Saturdays from 9 a.m. Uh, to 6 p.m. Uh, yes, uh, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., beg your pardon. And you'll see also from this picture that we're not a particularly impressive edifice, architecturally speaking. Kind of looks like a big old garage or storage space, which is kind of appropriate for a firefighting museum. But we try to lavish the real attention on what we think is really important, which is the collection. And I would like to now, you know, starting with the next slide, give you a little tour of some of the, just, just a small number of the highlights of our, uh, of our collection. And this is really where the tours almost always start, which is our 1725 Newsham hand pumper. This is the largest, uh, or excuse me, the oldest large piece, I should say, uh, that we have here in Gallery One. Gallery One, which happens to be my favorite uh, gallery in the museum, is, a, is 19th century and earlier, hand and horse drawn. And it's a, a 
where we really see how a lot of this technology evolved and started to come to uh, become really effective. Because prior to this, firefighting was done most places in the world with buckets of water. The famous bucket brigade that you see in the Western movies where the church is on fire and everybody passes buckets of water and the last guy gets as close to the fire as he can, usually not very close, and he uh, tries to throw his bucket of water in the fire. Terrible way to fight a fire, but it was all they had. When these came in, these actually came in, this one is from 1725. I always tell the little kids, the school kids that are in there, this was built about six or seven years before George Washington was born. And it was built, you know, 50, 60 years before the United States became the United States when we were still colonies. Uh, and right there in Philadelphia, that happened, of course. And uh, what you see here is this one goes back so far. They were invented in Holland a little before this, the mid to late 1600s. And in the case of this one, this goes back so far that it doesn't even really have very good hose. What you have is this hopper here, and they would still use the bucket brigade, but instead of the last guy feebly trying to throw his bucket of water on the fire, he would pour it into the hopper. This tub down here holds about 80 gallons of water, and these handles that you see on either side, a crew of guys would pump up and down. There's also some brake pedals that they could stand on and pump. And there's a twin cylinder pump in this casing, it goes up and down on a chain, and that would give you a stream of water out of this rigid brass pipe. They called it a branch pipe. And as you can see, that's angled upward, so you could arc the water in to a you know, a front door, a porch window, or something like that, but you could also use it to wet down all the trees and the bushes and the neighbor's houses and stuff like that, because as we know, part of the problem, especially in those days, is it wouldn't be just your house that would burn. You could have two, three of your neighbor's houses burn. You could have whole city blocks burn. Whole towns were known to burn. Whole chunks of big cities were known to burn, and this was the first invention that gave you a real shot at kind of preventing that, stopping that, shutting fires down. And one perfect, but, and it seems very primitive, but the truth is this technology was a game changer. It's, uh, if you look in the first part of the museum and you can see even some of the ones in the background of this picture, they get bigger, they get prettier, they get fancier. About 1820, they get good fire hose, but it's the same basic design, handles on either side and crews of, of guys pumping up and down on either side. And that, was really effective. And it was one of the things that allowed the Industrial Revolution to happen. It was one of the things that allowed big cities like Philly to grow and to develop into metropo real metropolitan areas was machines like this. And they were all over the world. Uh, they, they had you know this stuff. We, we have a couple pieces from Japan uh, from the 1880s that show that this technology evolved in similar ways in different parts of the world. But if you want to talk about, and it'll be a special interest to you folks uh, from the city of brotherly love, probably my favorite piece in the whole museum, it is, oops, this one. And this is our 1844 Bates Jeffers hand pumper built in the good city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was built by in 1844, so it's more than 100 years younger than the one I just showed you. And this is what they call a Philadelphia style pumper. Or sometimes they call it a double decker pumper. And we have one of the few, I understand there's one in the collection of the Smithsonian that was in Delaware that was also made by Bates. But this one was in the city of Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And uh, the, uh, the Joel Bates firm in Philadelphia built this in 1844, sold it to Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And it was customized there by a man named Jeffers who later went into the pump making business himself. But this is a particularly beautiful piece and also a very powerful piece. With this piece, you could generate a lot of water to get on a fire. The way it worked was this, it's, in this photo, it's laid out the way, you know, the, these hand, uh, hand handles here, there's a set up here, there's a set up here, set here, set here. And then here and here you have these platforms and the platforms would lay out horizontally and you'd have a crew of guys, probably 12 guys each side up on these platforms and probably 13 guys each side down on the on the ground. And the guys up here are working this set of these sets of handles. The guys down here are working these sets of handles. 
And as this mechanism goes up and down, right here you can see there is a valve for a hose. And on the other side, in the same spot on the other side, there is a valve for another hose. On the other side, the valve would go out to probably a portable wooden uh, hydrant that you would bring with you. And you would dig down till you hit the wooden water main. You would break it open with a big old auger. You'd screw in your portable hydrant, or you could just drop it into a river or a creek or something if, you, if that was what you had, or a cistern. Uh, and that's your draft hose. And then on this side is your clay hose or your discharge hose. And with all those guys pumping this up and down, you get a pretty good yield of water. You get about 250 gallons of water a minute. So it was pretty powerful for a hand pumped piece. Uh, so you could kind of punch a fire in the nose with this thing. Trouble was, after 15, 20 minutes of all these guys, 50 guys, 25 each side, or, you know, 100 hands pumping up and down on this thing, they get really tired and they could barely lift their arms over their heads. And so uh, ideally you needed a second crew and that second crew meant you needed about a hundred guys to run this thing for any length of time. And that was the problem in big cities. This is a kind of a big city or a larger town piece. Uh, firefighters in big cities in those days, a lot of times anybody who wanted to could found one as long as the other crews would let you, as long as they wouldn't come and beat you up. And so what you had a lot of times were essentially, the fire departments were essentially street gangs. They broke down along racial or ethnic or religious lines. They fought for turf. They had political influence and they did all this other stuff that the local governments got really tired of. In some cases, like in New York, during the time of Boss Tweed, the famous Tammany Hall political machine there, the uh, these alliances of different fire departments got so powerful that they were like a shadow government. They'd become more powerful than the mayor's office. The local governments wanted to get rid of them. It probably was true in Philadelphia, I would guess. It was definitely true in New York, Boston, Chicago, Baltimore, places like that. And so, but the trouble is when you have a huge crew like this that you need to run this equipment, there's not any option of making a city fire department, a professional city fire department that's a government job out of that. You can't put all those guys on the city payroll. It just isn't going to work. So they needed a new invention. And of course, we all know what that invention was, and we'll get to it very shortly. But first, and I get a little bogged down talking about this because I love this particular piece so much. I just wanted everybody to notice what a work of art it is. There, that You see the one mural you can see there. We believe that's Rebecca at the well from the Old Testament. There's paintings of St. Euphemia from the Orthodox Catholic Church the Great Seal of the State of Rhode Island. Uh, there's a, a, a Indian sachem, a Native American sachem from uh, Massachusetts, Prince Philip. And these were all put on there and they were under a coat of white paint when this came into the museum many years ago. And our restorer, wonderful man named Don Hale, who passed on a few years ago at the age of 94, he painstakingly removed all that paint and he found these paintings underneath those. And when you find a really beautiful, fancy, elegant, sometimes even kind of gaudy piece of fire equipment like this, chances are it's American. American firefighters, they, they didn't just want to get to the fire, they wanted to look good getting there. And this is a great example of this. And it was competitive. They would compete with the guys at the station down the street or the next town over or whatever it was. And so, and you see this I mean, you see it with all firefighters everywhere, but you really see it with the American firefighters. And it's also true of this piece, which is if that last one is what a big city or a larger town would have, this is what a village or a rural community or a, a, a smaller, you know, a small town would have. This one uh, is the from the Badger Fire Company, and you can guess that's from Wisconsin. Uh, this was built in the 1800s by a company in St. Louis, Missouri called Rumsey. Uh, and it was sold to a little tiny German farming town in uh, Wisconsin called Centerville Township, Wisconsin. We also have their bell and we have their ladder wagon. So I think we basically have their whole department here at the museum. But this particular little hand pumper, as you can see, it, it was very efficient. It, the handles fold in and there's a squirrel tail draft hose that flips over the top. 
and it's got that high front end. So it's got a big turning radius up front. So you can really angle that front end where you want it. So it's an excellent little piece. It's also highly decorated, very beautiful. Don also restored this one. What's really special to us, particularly about this piece, it's a neat piece, but uh, and would be anyway, but this piece also was used to fight the Great Chicago Fire. And in October of 1871, we just uh, had its 150th anniversary this past October. And uh, the guys in this little town loaded this onto a flat car and took it by train down to Chicago uh, a couple of days after that started. They didn't get there till the last day, so it's hard to say how much they really got to do. But they supposedly, they sprayed a little water on the last day of the Great Chicago Fire. And so it's all that is also very special to us about this piece is that this one has a, sort of a specific and really legendary piece of firefighting history connected to us. Now, this is another big favorite of ours here at the museum. I'm just talking about, let's call it firefighter vanity. Uh, we, you know, firefighters love to show off. And this is an example of that. When we have the little kids in there, and actually a lot of times when we have the adults in there, somebody invariably says that this looks like what Cinderella went to the ball in. And it does. And that's not by accident. It was made, built to kind of resemble a royal carriage a little bit. This one was built in uh, the city of um, New York by a carriage maker there called Buckley and Merritt in 1870. And they um, built it for a little uh, fire department called uh, the Hotchkiss Fire Department, which is in Derby, Connecticut. They still exist. They have a picture of this rig on their patch to this day. And it's big and gorgeous and elegant and all that. If you look right behind it, where my pointer is, you can see a hose reel with a real hose on it. And this was built in 18, in a little earlier in the 1850s in the city of Reading, Pennsylvania. And it was built for who else? The city of Philadelphia. And that is a real functional fire carriage, a real functional hose carriage that you would actually have taken the hose to a fire with there in Philly. And behind it, if you could see it, which you can't in this picture, you would see another elegant, beautiful, uh, hose carriage that was also a just a parade piece like this one from uh, the city of the town of Fishkill Landing, New York, up in the Hudson Valley in New York. But this one from Philly was the real deal. They would actually take this and you, you know, you can't get a real good look at it. I probably should have included a good picture of it for you folks. It's got these beautiful clam shells or oyster shells or something on the side. And it's very fancy and elegant. And yet it was really to take to a fire. And that was the story with these. Firefighters, again, especially American firefighters, they love to have this fancy, elegant, beautiful stuff, but the trouble was occasionally you had to take it to a fire and it would get beat up and dinged up and scratched and mud and water and smoke and everything else all over it. And these guys got very tired of seeing this stuff that they were they loved so much get beat up. And so eventually they just developed a very simple hose reel called a crab or a jumper or a spider. And they would uh, pull that behind some other piece of apparatus. And then if they could afford it, they would have something like this, just to be in parades and look beautiful. And if you could see this in action while they were pulling it down, you know, the guys would hang on to these hand grips, but they all, you can also see this rope. You could pull that rope out some length ahead of it and have as many guys as you needed, basically, pull this thing, wearing their most beautiful outfits, their most beautiful uniforms. And this would turn this inner cylinder, which is mirrored. A lot of times in those days, parades were at night. So these lanterns would give you this beautiful, sparkly, twinkly light show. Up top, you can't see it all that well in the picture, but there is a statue of the kids always giggle, naked guy with grape leaf and wings on his feet. That is Hermes, if you're a Greek, or Mercury, if you're a Roman, but he's the son of Zeus or Jupiter in mythology, and he is the messenger of the gods, so he's a symbol of speed. So this would go rolling down the street, looking just spectacular, advertising your, your fire department, and really showing that you had the best fire department, and that was what you hoped, at least. There's also bells up front, so you're making a great deal of noise and racket while you're doing it, and so it's a great example of the pride that firefighters take in their in being firefighters, first of all, but also in their communities. And of course, we all know that small town companies 
often have a tendency to have a beautifully restored fire truck uh, now that has kind of taken the place of this, and that's that's their parade piece. It's always a big favor with us. Now, whoops, I jumped ahead a little. Now we come though to the next big uh, leap forward in firefighting technology, and that of course is the steam engine. And they came in in the early-ish 1850s, and they were what really enabled a professional fire service to develop in a place, you know, in a, in a city like, like Philadelphia, like uh, Phoenix eventually when we, when we caught up to that, Chicago, New York, any of those. This one is, uh, was built in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it's a later one. This one is from 1904. It was built for the city of Reno, Nevada. And it was pulled by three horses. The other things I've shown you were pulled by hand by big crews of firefighters. But this one has this big tank here. And if it resembles a locomotive crane to you, that's not by accident. It was uh, a, it's an adaptation of locomotive, steam locomotive technology. But here you have this uh, big tank, which is full of water. But the water, of course, is not to put on the fire. The water down here is boiled with a, a coal furnace, and that boils the water, which turns to steam. The steam turns uh, is forced into steam pipes in the lower part of the smokestack up here, and the pressure from that steam is used to turn the pistons, the piston rods, on a big old steam engine. There's a flywheel to keep the momentum going, and these pistons down here create a vacuum, and these hard suction sleeves are attached to that vacuum and you draft water through those hard suction sleeves and then you expel the water through a smaller gauge of hose on one of these valves here or here. And it is pretty high tech for the time and it was pretty high maintenance for the time too, but it was a big leap forward because all of a sudden, there's a couple advantages really. The big one was it was really powerful. That big hand pumper built in Philly for uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, that would get you 250 gallons of water a minute, which is outstanding for a hand pumper. But this one would get you six to 700 gallons of water a minute. So you could really kind of, you know, belt a fire in the jaw with this. Also, almost equally important, it was very, very efficient. You didn't need those big crews anymore. One guy sat up here, he drove it, he was the driver. One or two other guys, the engineer and or the stoker, would ride back here in the coal scuttle and they would tend the fire. And when they got there, the engineer would come over here, he's got his lantern here, and he would tend the engine. And you'd have a few more guys that would come in another way, another couple wagons with axes and ladders and hoses and maybe Dalmatians to guard the horses and all that good stuff. But basically you could now staff an urban fire station in a, in a good sized town with eight, 10, 12 guys a shift. And so it became possible for firefighting to become a real job, a real profession instead of a, a volunteer thing. That was in the big cities. In the small towns and rural communities, like my little hometown of Harbor Creek, Pennsylvania, uh, firefighting is still to this day done by volunteers. They, back in the day, they really couldn't afford steamers. Not so, I mean, steamers were expensive and they were high maintenance. You had to have an engineer who knew what he was doing, but the real expense was the horses. There was not a pro, this thing is incredibly heavy. I've helped move it. I can tell you that firsthand. And so you needed horses and not just any horses, big, strong, muscular draft horses, uh, usually three of them to pull this thing. And so, and that was really expensive and really high maintenance. You needed veterinary care. You needed to feed them. You needed to maintain them. Uh, you had to put them out to pasture every 10, 12, 13 years and get new ones. And so uh, they, these were problematic in their own way, but it was the innovation that enabled firefighting to become a job, a real profession in the United States. Now, we move from there into Gallery 2, and I love Gallery 2 also. It features vehicles from, motorized vehicles, from the first half of the 20th century. And in the foreground here, you see uh, a truck from the great city of Baltimore, Maryland. 
and that is a Mac, uh, and it's a, it's a piece that I love a lot. Um, this is a uh, Mac that was built for the United States Army in 1919, and it uh, was uh, turned later, was sold as Army surplus, was a transport truck, but it was sold as Army surplus later in uh, uh, the 1920s, and Baltimore turned it using horse-drawn ladder wagons. They turned it into a a uh, nice ladder truck that must have been quite a majestic sight going down the streets of Charm City. Uh, you can also see on the far side there, there is a life net, one of those that were not necessarily such a great idea. They were very dangerous. Uh, and these two coppery tanks are uh, initial atta attack tanks. They're, they're chemical tanks. They were full of uh, sodium bicarbonate and water, and you would mix in a little vial or a little bottle of sulfuric acid, and that would create a chemical reaction that gave you a big, wonderful blast of water that uh, was very powerful. It didn't last very long, but it was very powerful and uh, really kept you, uh, kind of knocked the fire down while the pumpers were getting hooked up. Also on this side of the aisle, you can see a beautiful Aaron's Fox. This one came from a little town in Westchester uh, County, New York, that uh, for years was called uh, North Terrytown, but they recently switched back to their original name, which was Sleepy Hollow, New York, uh, you know, where the Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman and all that were, according to Washington Irving. And uh, for years, they kind of didn't like the association with being a spooky place. And so they called themselves North Terrytown. And then at some point they were like, what are we crazy? We, you know, missing out on a big tourist opportunity. This is an Aaron's Fox. And as some of you who are students of the motorized vehicles know, it's got this big old pump right down at the end. So it was very popular in places that had waterfronts, river fronts, lake fronts, ocean fronts. They didn't rip because you could just pull it down a pier, drop your or a beach and drop your draft hose in and draft as long as you wanted. Uh, they didn't like to use ocean water because the salt was real hard in the pump, but they would if they had to. And then you get the youngest guy in the department to clean it for hours when you get back to the station. So that's another one of our real, we have a couple of Aaron's Foxes and we're very proud of them too. They're, they, you know, I've always wondered about it being there in Sleepy Hollow because it's a pretty small town for a truck this powerful. They were, uh, it was a real point of pride for a, a community to have this kind of top level of a truck, but they were so powerful that at the beginning, they didn't know their own strength. They would sometimes like pull water mains up through sidewalks and things like that. So I always kind of wondered how that one landed in a little town like that in Westchester County. But in any case, it's now, you know, proudly on display here in Gallery 2. Now, if you want to talk about, and you can see why, what may be the most, probably the most beloved truck here in the museum, it's this one, and you can, can't really get all that good of a look at it, but it was a, it's the youngest truck in Gallery 2. It's a 1951 American La France from the town of Miami, Arizona. And it's the one that we don't put one of these white chains around to keep people's hands off. We encourage people, especially little kids, uh, to climb up on this. And my, you know, my daughter played on this truck many, many times, many times growing up. And you can see these guys are enjoying themselves as well. And so it's, a, I always tell people that it, the Hall of Fame is a great museum for adults. It's a serious, and it, I mean, we don't take ourselves too seriously, but we are a, a real history museum and we, we think you can really learn stuff here. We're also a great place to bring kids and grandkids. And we have members who their whole reason for having a membership is their grandkid is a freak for uh, uh, fire trucks. And so you bring the grandkid in, turn them loose on the, on the truck for a while and he blows off a little steam. And that's a, the example here. So the, this 51 La France cab forward uh, that proudly served the city of Miami, Arizona now proudly serves as a place for kids and grownups sometimes to, uh, you know, have their have their fun play time with, with a fire truck. And uh, this is that Mack truck and it's another angle. So you, on this, you can see that uh, life net that I was talking about and also the the big old bell. But the other thing you can see here is that blunt nose. This was built, in, as I said, as an army truck in 1919. In World War I, these were a very popular truck for the military, and not just for the American military, also for the British military. And the Brits, the Brit soldiers started calling these the bulldog because of that blunt front end. And Mac embraced that and, of course, turned it into 
their, uh, you know, kind of their trademark, which you can see up front on this truck, a 1948 Mac, uh, which is from the city of Pierce, South Dakota. Uh, this is kind of a smaller city truck, just a beautiful little truck from the mid-century, mid-century America, but it has the, uh, the blunt little bulldog uh, that we now associate, you know, everybody associates with, with Mack trucks. Now here is a truck which is very, very important in our collection because this is the truck that really started the Hall of Fame Museum. And we don't see it here in Gallery 2, which is where it is. We see it where it kind of uh, found its home. This was a 1924 American La France. And of course, firefighters all know American La France as probably the most famous of the automotive manufacturers that made fire trucks. They also made city buses, but their real specialty was fire trucks. And they were out of, in those days, out of Elmira, New York. They kind of hopped around the Eastern seaboard a little bit. And they did go chapter 11 a few years ago. Uh, but in 1924, they made this truck for the city of Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And Oshkosh had it for a long time. They had it for 31 years. And they really built these things to last. When it retired in 1955, it was sitting out in front of a car dealership in Wilmet, Illinois. And this guy, George Getz Jr., who was just a classic, you know, Midwestern rich guy, a classic entrepreneur, had a lot of commercial real estate holdings, and he was part owner of the Chicago Cubs for a period of time, and he was just a big deal in kind of the Chicago business scene. Uh, he lived in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin with his family, and he was driving through Wilmette, and he called to his wife. He saw this sitting out in front of a car dealership. He said, gee, it'd be fun to have one of those things. I wanted one of those since I was a little boy, well, what do you get for the man who has everything, right? So she sent her son Bert back to negotiate the sale of this thing, and he bought it, and they somehow kept it a secret from him until Christmas of 1955, and they gave it to him as a uh, gag gift, basically, but they didn't know what they started. He went nuts. He loved it, and as you can see, he gave his kids and neighborhood kids rides in it, and he uh, became interested really interested in the history and the technology of firefighting and he started to collect more and more trucks and in really a very short time 1961 he had uh, about enough trucks to start a small museum in Kenosha Wisconsin and some crony has said he should call it the Hall of Flame so we are the only museum I know of whose name is a pun uh, but we uh, so it started in 1961 we just had our 60th birthday, late December of, uh, of 1961, or no, excuse me, of this past year of 2021. And this, this piece, this La France is still can be seen uh, in gallery two here at the Hall of Flame. And oops, I went backwards. This, a lot of people would say this is maybe the prettiest truck we have. This, if you get the old timers in here, they'll tell you this is maybe the finest fire truck ever made. This is the Rolls Royce of fire trucks. And you can see from the front end, it's built to look like an old school touring car, like a Rolls or a Packard or a Duesenberg or a Stutz or something like that. And it's got a V12 engine under there and the pump for the water, get you well over 1200 gallons of water a minute. So this is the 400 series made in the mid to late thirties by La France. And this one was in Johnny Carson's hometown of Norfolk, Nebraska. We have another one that was from Burlington, Iowa. Uh, only 12 of them are known to survive. If you can believe it, most of the ones they made went for scrap in World War II, uh, but 12 of them are known to survive. We have two of them. And this one could do about 60 miles an hour, which the little kids are never impressed by, but a vehicle this big, that, and especially in the 1930s, that's pretty fast. And uh, it could get you a lot of water you get to the fire really fast, you get a lot of water on the fire when you got there. And never to be underestimated with firefighters, you look good getting there. And so we, uh, you know, if you had one of these, you were the envy of firefighters for 100 miles around, but not many of them, you know, uh, were made because it was the middle of the Great Depression. This cost about $13,000 in 1935, and it might as well have cost 35, you know, $13 million for all the more most places could afford it. So La France only made 179 of these, and we have two of them. Uh, this is a Stutz. As I was saying, uh, you know, a lot of different manufacturers made fire trucks. Uh, Ford made fire trucks. Chevy and Dodge made fire trucks. And there were all, all, you know, Mac made lots of great fire trucks. But there were also a lot of uh, 
smaller companies that are very famous. Everybody remembers the famous Stutz Bearcat. That was what they specialized in, was luxury cars and also early race cars. But they made some fire trucks. They sold this one to the city of Avde Grace, Maryland in the 20s. And then later, Avde Grace sold it back to them. And they refurbished it a little and they sold it to the city of uh, Farmland, Indiana. And so uh, it's just an interesting piece. People don't always think of Stutz as being a fire truck manufacturer, but they were. Now we move into the Hall of Heroes, which is one of the more kind of somber parts of the museum, but we're very proud of it. And it's where we do honor to firefighters who died in the line of duty or were decorated for bravery. This painted pony exhibit, which was in one of the terminals in LaGuardia Airport uh, for a number of years, uh, is now in the Hall of Heroes and it commemorates the first responders, the uh, FDNY and the NYPD and the New York and New Jersey Port Authority. Uh, who died in 9-11. Of course, there were many other first responders who died in 9-11, and also a lot of civilians who behaved very heroically and showed great courage and resourcefulness and risked their lives, and in some cases, lost their lives, in a few cases, lost their lives, uh, helping their fellow citizens get out of that building. So I always try to remind people that, yes, we saw some of the worst in human behavior that day. We also saw some of the best in human behavior that day, and, and that always kind of helps me to process it. But the Hall of Heroes is not just about the 9-11 firefighters. It's also, we have a memorial to the Granite Mountain hotshots who died here in Arizona, uh, I think it was, what, seven years ago, something like that, uh, in 20, 2013, up in near the town of Yarnell, uh, south of Prescott. And we also have a lot of just individual acts of fire, uh, firefighter line of deaths, but also line of duty deaths, but also firefighters who didn't die, but were decorated for bravery or uh, who, um, you know, did something valorous or whatever. And so it's a, it's a very moving part of the museum and, and we are very proud of it. All right, so here we move into gallery three and this truck is actually not on display now. It's, in, it's down in our storage area, but this is uh, from, you know, we had one from South Dakota, so it's only fair we have one from North Dakota. This is a, an American La France uh, from 1948 also from uh, the city of Jamestown, North Dakota. It's an absolutely gorgeous truck. I am told that that front end, which kind of resembles a face, was the model that uh, the Disney Pixar folks used uh, for the fire truck in the Cars movies, or the Planes movies, or maybe both, I don't know. Um, but the, so, you know, it kind of looks like it has a smiley face. You see that uh, anthropomorphic side of things with this truck too. This is a 1956 Van Pelt, and this is one of the relatively few pieces that we have actually from here in the valley, here in the Valley of the Sun. This one was in the city of Mesa, Arizona, and they called it Mesa in those days. Van Pelt was a big maker out west for a period of time in the 1940s. It was the biggest, it was in California, and it was a guy who, Van Pelt, who broke off from Dodge and started making fire trucks, and he for a time was the biggest manufacturer of fire trucks west of the Mississippi. They didn't have a big profile uh, east, back east, but here in the west, they were big deal. And in Mesa, they called this truck the Red Rat. And it, it's much more noticeable if this front lantern, which is red, is on because it looks like a rat nose and these look like the eyes and that looks like the face. So it too kind of has a face, but it has just this beautiful, majestic, decoy looking front end and it's something I'm very very fond of. We had another Van Pelt from up north in the Flagstaff area. Uh, Timberline Fernwood had a little squirrel on the door. That one is out at one of the excellent zoos and safari parks here in our uh, community uh, called uh, uh, Wildlife World Zoo out in Litchfield Park, Arizona. And that uh, is also something you can see if you go in there, which if you come and visit the valley you should. Most of the big vehicles that we have here uh, are from the United States. And it's not because we wouldn't love to have vehicles from all over the world. We would absolutely love to have vehicles from all over the world. But it's pretty prohibitively expensive to bring vehicles from all over the world. But we do have a couple. We have one uh, big Unimog, Mercedes Metz Unimog, from a uh, little German town on the North Sea, uh, sea coast, Stad. Uh, and we also have this. This is an ERF or ER Foden, but they call it an ERF from 1967. And it's from Great Britain. It served the town of Retford, which was in Nottinghamshire where Robin Hood did his thing. And uh, they had this truck from the 60s until the 80s. After a while, it became uh, part of the European division of Mattel, the toy company. They used it for promotional purposes. And then it, the 
executive who inherited it kind of when he retired as a retirement gift. He donated it to, the, uh, to, to us and he paid for it to be transported all the way from France where he retired to. And so it came all the way across the Atlantic and through the Panama Canal and up the west coast of Mexico and into Long Beach, California. And then volunteers from here drove it in rush hour LA traffic, by the way, all the way over to uh, Phoenix from, from the Long Beach area. So it's a terrific truck. It's what the Brits call a fire escape. We think of that as a metal staircase outside a building to go, you know, for people to get out of. But up top, there is a huge ladder, a big extension ladder, uh, aerial ladder that's on wheels and it pops off the back of this thing and it's really, really heavy. And so to most of the chassis of this truck is made out of wood covered with what the Brits would call aluminum. And uh, so they, and as you will also notice, unlike fire, American firefighters of this period, most of the firefighters here rode inside what they call omnibus style, what the Brits call. And it was much, much safer, of course, but in America, of course not, you gotta look cool. You gotta ride on the running board or the back step or something like that. And uh, it was more clear when it was into the eighties, at least. How, how late was it, Chuck? 1987. Yeah, so the late 80s before American, most American fire companies decided they needed to ride inside and be safe. Uh, but this is one that uh, I, we're particularly fond of here. This is also, I was talking about Aaron's Fox before, this one came from River Forest, Illinois, and it's a big quad. It's got all these different uh, companies. It's a pumper, carries hose. You can carry a uh, a small number of ladders and it also has a tank for providing you know water right when you roll up to a fire so it has at least four functions uh it's a great big clunky truck that has been in most fire uh, most of the fiesta bowl parades and to the guy who drives it we we're, we have a presence of several trucks in the fiesta bowl parade every year my daughter and i got to ride up on top of one of the trucks uh, a few years ago that was really fun uh, but the guy who drives this truck uh, always says that his leg hurts for about a week driving this thing at parade speed because uh, it is not a power transmission and it's not power steering. But it does have that big, majestic, uh, spherical air chamber up front. This one was also on Antiques Roadshow when they came and visited Phoenix. And uh, that was a, a great boon for us. And here, of course, you see, you can, you can also see it in the background of this photo. You see a, a sad but very proud exhibit, which is one of the transport trucks that carried the Granite Mo Mountain hotshots on their last run and many runs before that. Uh, they were a Prescott City company, but they were a hotshot company, which was kind of an experimental thing in itself. And they died in a uh, bad wildfire uh, just north of here and south of Prescott, just a little north of Wickenburg, called a little tiny town called Yarnell. And they got in a little too close to the fire, the wind changed and the fire started coming toward him. And Chuck, you knew most of those guys, did you not? I knew a handful, yes. Yeah, and uh, so only one, there was a 20 man crew, only one of them survived. And uh, we were, uh, you know, he had a hard time, although I guess he's doing well now. Uh, and we uh, are very, very proud to host this. There were two of these buggies. The other one is in Los Angeles at the County Fire Museum of LA, another very good fire museum, but not as good as us. And, uh, but we're proud of this piece because uh, it, it, it is, you know, it was a tough day in the fire service. It was also a tough day for folks here in Arizona. And so we're, we're proud to commemorate these just excellent young men who said, say, lost their lives that day. And then I want Chuck to talk a little bit about this piece, if you wouldn't mm -hmm. mind, Chuck. This is Rescue 4, and, and you, some of you probably know what this is. Now, Rescue 4 is an HME uh, from 1996. And... Uh, important piece that uh, ended here at the museum after it was uh, pulled from the, the wreckage of 9-11. Unfortunately, uh, that day, nine brave firefighters from New York City perished on this truck. And uh, months prior, the same vehicle had inv been involved in uh, an incident called the Father's Day fire. So this truck has immense uh, importance to the New York City Fire Department, and we dedicated it on August 14th of this year, after years and years of restoration work, and uh, a large chunk of the New York City Fire Department came to see and brought us a certificate of appreciation, as well as the attendance of their assistant chiefs, and then another assistant chief just visited us uh, two weeks ago. So we're um, we're quite uh, 
honored to have it and it stays in gallery four all the time and it's uh it, it is a huge fire truck they don't actually their rescues that they use now uh, aren't quite as big as this they found this to be enormous for trying to get around the city and they've they've downsized the cabs significantly because all six of the uh of four of the six folks that are on board on a normal day uh ride in the back uh, center hallway area and only two right up front so the new trucks are kind of configured in that fashion but uh, once again we're proud to have it and new york is happy that it's here so yeah we we are i believe and i'm right about this check that we're the only uh place that has a vehicle from 9-11 on display except at the exhibit at ground zero correct That's correct yes. yeah and so just quickly because i know that we're down to the wire here this is our wildland gallery this is a moreland pumper from 1930 one of my favorite trucks uh in the museum donated to us by the cowboy star gene autry this used to serve a fire station in believe it or not topanga canyon back in the 1930s it's i guess kind of ritzyville in in the valley now but in those days uh it was uh kind of the wilderness. Uh, Gene Autry donated it to us and Don, our restorer, our late restorer, uh, brought it back to its former glory. And then finally, our buddy Smokey the Bear. I always love to tell the story of Smokey. That's our wildland gallery. And uh, that's another thing that's very much worth seeing. But I don't want to, I, I kind of, you know, see that we're getting down to the wire on time. So I want, I did, if, if anybody had any questions, the other thing I wanted to point out is just, uh, we have a YouTube channel. And we have lots and lots of videos. Uh, many of them are me running my mouth about these exhibits, just like I was just doing. Uh, but we, you'll see some other people. We have story times for the kids, a big variety of stuff for you to look at. We have over 70 of these videos. And uh, so we would invite you to go to YouTube, search for the Hall of Flame YouTube channel on YouTube. That's the uh, URL for it. Uh, but if anyone has any questions or any kind of closing comments, oh, I did want to see, could I get my, the image of us back up on the screen, Brian? Is that possible? Uh, I, I wanted to show everybody also our Milo and Moxie, which is a program that we uh, partner with the Arizona Burn Foundation on. Uh, we have a kids area here, which I didn't show you in the presentation, but it's a hands-on fun place for kids to play, but it's also themed to these two little characters. I should be pointing it this way, I guess. Uh, you can see the little hummingbird and also the cute little corgi uh, who learn together about burn safety, burn pre prevention, and fire safety. Uh, so our, our educational programs for kids are really, really central to our mission here. We just did a whole school district here in the Phoenix area, the Cartwright School District. We had we did every second grade class in that district, and we did our story time program and our fire safety presentation for them. And that's another huge part of our mission. We love the historical stuff, but if you come right down to it, uh, at the end of the day, uh, helping people live through fires and not get burned and stuff like that, that's the most important thing there is. Uh, okay, so if anybody has a question uh, for either me or Chuck, we're ready Mark, to- Mark, we, we're ready we to did take some out. questions um, during your presentation. Uh, one okay. from one of our attendees, Mike Snyder asked, um, he recently learned that the Hall of Flame has the Vincent O'Meara photographic and fire history paper collection. Is there an easy way to find a copy of the inventory of this collection? And does the Hall of Flame have any of Vincent's apparatus in the museum? Have any of Vin Vincent's Illinois? Uh, Vincent O'Meara photographic. Oh, Vincent O'Meara. Um, we do have an enormous uh, collection of photographs and printed material, a huge paper collection. So that's the good news. The bad news is it is incredibly disorganized. Over the years, it has become, over the decades, it has become incredibly disorganized and it's very hard to find anything specific. However, if the gentleman emails me with what he might be looking for, we can certainly have a look. It sometimes takes us a while to dig through and see if we can find anything. Uh, but you, know, you all have my, uh, Brian, you have my email if you want to uh, pass it along to the this this gentleman uh, we'd be happy to if he can give us an idea of what he's looking for where it's from and so forth we can see what we can find yes we have an enormous yeah we have a library for one thing but we also have an enormous file of photos and prints and old newspapers and stuff like that it's just that unfortunately uh, 
it's not electrically accessible at this point. It's um, info at hallofflame.org. You yeah. can either mark, uh, write Mark directly, his email, or just uh, go to info yeah. at hallofflame.org. Yes, absolutely. Great. And can, can you talk a little bit about how large your storage area is? We can. Uh, you, Chuck, you probably know better than I the square footage. Yeah, it's uh, the, uh, the what we call the shop, the area down where we store additional things waiting to come into the museum, uh, hosts uh, right around um, 48 fire trucks. Um, and then we rotate those up into gallery three and on a, on a, on a pretty regular twice a month roughly basis. Um, and it's that building is about 60 feet wide by 90 feet long. And it's it's separated by the parking lot, so so we're in two different. Our main building's about the size of a Walmart, and the shop would be about the size of a Kmart. Right, and it's you know it also we, you know we don't do much in the way of really ambitious restoration anymore. Uh, an exception was Rescue Four, uh, which was kind of spearheaded by some guys who volunteer here who have some of those kind of restore restoration skills, and they did a unbelievably great job of getting that back to presentability. It had been badly damaged when the buildings came down, when the towers collapsed and the front, especially the front end was real dented and pitted and cratered up with uh, the rubble that hit it. Uh, but these a guy named Mark Anello here and uh, another guy named Rick Stu and a few other of our volunteers really put in some extraordinary work and they got some of the subcontractors and providers to donate new versions of old parts that needed to be replaced and stuff like that. So that was an exception. Ever since uh, Don Hale passed on, uh, what, six, seven years ago, something like that, we have had to back off from a lot of our more ambitious restoration projects. Joined now by another uh, firefighter, uh, Bob Bombiati, who is, uh, you're a New Jersey guy, right, Bob? Well, I was born in New Jersey. Yeah, so he's crossed the river. 42 and, years out here. Though. Yeah, 42 yeah. years out here. He's, <laughs> he's an Arizonan. Uh, he's a Zoni. But um, Don was, a, and it's one of the reasons that, it's one of the things that makes our uh, collection so, so distinctive is that Don had a really uncommon set of skills. He apprenticed under his grandfather in the 1930s in Los Angeles, and his grandfather built period vehicles for the movie industry. He built them for MGM and Paramount University, all those Universal and all the studios. And he had a big fleet of carriages and buckboards and uh, you know anything else you can imagine for that you might use for a period movie. And he would he built them initially, I think, for MGM, but he later bought the fleet himself and rented it. Well, Don apprenticed with his grandfather and his grandfather's co-workers. And the guys he apprenticed under were guys like wheelwrights and spoke makers and, uh, you know, uh, uh, axle makers and stuff like that. Guy, you know, it was skills that were becoming archaic even in the 1930s. And so he uh, learned a lot of stuff that, I mean, they say nobody's irreplaceable, but Don was pretty close in our opinion. He was a, uh, uh, he was quite a guy and we miss him. Uh, he knew how to do gold leafing. And not only did he have that experience in building and tooling his own parts and all of that incredible stuff. He had those skills, but he also had a fire background in the city of San, uh, San Luis Obispo, California. Uh, he was an assistant chief in the fire department. He mostly was not an active firefighter. He was somebody who customized, supervised the purchase and then the customization of their fire trucks. Uh, but he did end uh, in, at the rank of assistant chief there in San Luis Obispo. So he was just... Uh, It'd be hard to find somebody better suited for the role of in which he spent, I don't know, close to 40 years here uh, as our restorer. And he did this extraordinary work and he took great pride in it. You can see his signature on many of the rigs as you go through the museum. And so uh, they all have kind of, they all kind of bear his touch, but they're also really accurate. He was real scrupulously accurate in working to get them the way they would have looked in the fire stations, wherever they were. And, and what year did the museum move from Wisconsin to Arizona? I believe it, 72, yeah, I believe it moved to the valley in 72, and then it was 
briefly in Scottsdale, but then the, we've been in this location since I think 73 or 74. And we, this used to be, this area we're in was kind of an entertainment district. There was an amusement park called Legend City across the street from where we all are now. The Phoenix Zoo is right across Van Buren Street from us, the back of the Phoenix Zoo is across. And then just a little farther north is the uh, Desert Botanical Gardens, which is an extraordinary botanical gardens of desert flora and fauna. And uh, now we're across from one of the power companies here, uh, Salt River Project. Uh, we're also next door to Phoenix Municipal Stadium, which was a baseball stadium. It used to be the spring training home of the Oakland A's, and now it's ASU baseball. Uh, so we'd get their fly balls off of their practice field on our roof every once in a while. Uh, but so it, it used to be kind of, you know, it's a, a little more of a, uh, I don't know how to put it, kind of a, an industrial park flavor almost now. Um, but it was... Uh, We've been in this, you know, part of that entertainment district for a very long time. We're on a five, and we're on five acres here. We have a five acres. Yeah, side. it's actually quite a beautiful area. The other side of the street is Tempe. We're in Phoenix, and uh, we are in a sort of a desert area that's uh, really quite lovely to be in. There's a gully down behind us, and we can hear the coyotes howling sometimes, and all that good stuff. And every once in a while, we have to catch a snake or something and escort him outside. <laughs> so you know, but don't. But that's scary off from coming in. Well, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask our attendees if anybody would like to ask any questions, um, feel free free to use the raise hand feature and we can open up your line so that you can ask your questions of Mark and Chuck directly. Are you able to um, are you seeing us or are you seeing the PowerPoint still? Uh, we see both of you actually. Oh good. Okay, good. I just scroll through yeah, sure. If anybody's got, yeah, here's some of the, some of the pieces. And, and by the way, this is total tip of the iceberg stuff. This is only a very, very small percentage of the stuff there is to see. And, you know, if people were really gluttons for punishment, they can get a guided tour and, and I can blab on about all of this stuff and much more, uh, you know, all the way through, uh, you know, all the way through the museum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it will. What, this one? First oh, okay, first slide. Uh, but yes, you can also find, uh, it doesn't look like it will. Oh, you have to do that, yeah. What do you have to do? Oh, control click. Control, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to hand, hand this presentation back oh. over to Brian now. Yeah, and, and you can also, yes, you can also see our, uh, if, if it's on your screen now, you can also see our website, which we really encourage people uh, to check out, which is um, holloflame.org. In our 60th, well, we, yeah. we, we have a newsletter up on our homepage that's posted that you can see 12 pages of, uh, of stories mm -hmm. about our, uh, uh, our 60th anniversary. Right. Oh, that nice piece. Look at that. Yeah, it was very good. Fantastic. Really look forward to getting uh, over to Philly someday and, and coming and visiting the Fireman's Hall too. Uh, it looks like a really terrific I had place. The, I had the pleasure and get to meet Brian personally. He was an yeah. incredible host for the uh, for my stay in Philly yeah. and and the fire chief Adam was uh, uh, quite gracious and and we really had a great time and yeah. I, I can't express enough uh, appreciation. For Another thing that I, I do try to uh, remind people of and you know I'm sure Brian does too is it, it's quite an important city in the history of firefighting. I mean, the, the double-decker style, Philadelphia uh, style pumpers were built there. Uh, and, uh, you know, Ben Franklin was in residence there for a long time. And uh, he was one of the founders of the organized fire service. There was just a lot of people like to say he was the first. I don't think he was the first, but he was a pretty early one to organize. As a, one, of our, uh, one of our docents, Gary says, in the early days, everybody was a firefighter, men, women, and children. If there was a fire, you turned out and you grabbed a bucket and you threw it, tried to throw it on there. Organized firefighting came a little later and Philly was one of the, would have been one of the first places where it did long before the U.S. was even the U.S. And of course, there's the Liberty Bell. The Liberty Bell, a lot of people don't always note, was a fire bell. It's May, you know, we remember it ringing in 1776 when the U.S. declared its independence. But the Liberty Bell's main job was it was there to alert the uh, the firefighters of a fire in uh, in Philly. Wow. 
Well, I want to thank both of you for joining us tonight and giving us an awesome presentation. Uh, I'm looking forward to my visit out there in May. Uh, to Get see out both of you and Mark. And for all my, my viewers tonight, please don't forget, thank you for joining us. Don't forget that we also need your support. So look us up on our social media platforms. And if you like, you can make your donation to the Fireman's Farm Museum. We're a nonprofit and that's how we occur our revenue through donations as well as visit our gift shop to see what t-shirts or other fire memorabilia you'd like to buy. Until next yeah. time, you guys be safe and have a safe journey. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark. It was great. Thanks, Chuck. Oh, you're welcome. I hope you uh, I hope you venture out here, Carol. Well, yeah, I've been, been there twice and I intend to get there a third time for sure. Quite, quite a quite a lot of changes you'll notice this time. I bet. I can't wait. And Lisa, we'd love to have you. And Brian, of course, we look forward to you coming soon. Yes, Lisa. Yep. See you guys in May. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Have you made your reservations yet, Brian? Say again? Hey, Brian. Yeah. Have you made your accommodations yet? Yes, I did. At the, did. At the, yep, I did. As soon as I got... And Brian, yeah. is this going to be available? Like, oh, sorry. Would you yeah, not, Mark, I again? will catch up with you tomorrow about the uh, the links for the, the video. Terrific. I'd love to.